Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning, Summit. How are you? You're good. I'm going to trust that you all said you're good. I wish you could see the auditorium right now because it is really different. We're cleaning and getting ready for next Sunday. I'm good. All right, thank you, Danielle. And uh, there's no way for you to tell unless they point the camera down, but there's only like 10 or 12 chairs in here, and it is... Edward, you thought it was weird before? Try doing this. Amen. All right, so um, Edward's been preaching a series on uh, spiritual warfare and just the idea of having the armor of God. And um, before I get to that, I, I want to I give you an illustration just real quick. When I was in high school, we were on the soccer team. We were uh, pr pretty good. We uh, won district every year, went to a regional tournament a few times, um, won the top teams in the state. And we would have games where we would play against, you know, subpar teams, play down to, to their level, not do very good. And I can remember this one year year where I was a backup and the guy ahead of me got hurt so I got to start that night had a great first half probably played one of the best halves that I personally had ever played the problem was is that we were losing one to nothing at halftime so we go into the locker room I'm feeling good about myself but not so good about the team and so we get in there and we get an old-fashioned butt chewing from the coach and it's interesting when you're in those moments where you know you've done your job and you know you've done everything you could possibly do, but the team is not playing well, is how do you respond to that kind of talk, knowing that it's not about me. It is about the team. And so regardless of how well I was playing, the goal was not for me to play well. The goal was for the team to play well. I've also been in situations where I've been in locker rooms where I have not played well. And I knew that when the coach was up there to speak, that he was speaking directly to me because I was the one at fault and I needed to step up my game. Now, why do I share that with you? Because we are the church. And although we are comprised of many people in many parts, we have a message that we should be conveying to this world. Some of us are doing a really good job. And the fact of the matter is that some of us aren't. And I don't know where you fit in this spectrum. But today, I want to talk about we as the church. Because at the end of the day, our message matters. And whether I'm the one that's at fault or whether I'm the one that's doing a really good job, the perception that the world sees is a whole perception of the church. They're judging the church based off the overall macro level of what we're doing and what we're saying. Last week, Edward should have warned me to bring my shin guards because I got kicked in the shins twice during his message. I got really convicted when he started using phrases like, we need to be using words. You know that old saying, uh, evangelize and then if possible, use words? No, we need to be using words. That was the first kick of the shin. Second kick in the shin was when he said, we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. And that one really hurt. I know not everybody's on Facebook. I know not everybody has a social media platform. But for most of us that are on social media, that seems to be what a lot of us use as our voice. 
We'll share things, we'll share memes, and we'll share uh, quotes, and we'll share pictures, and we'll hide behind the keyboard, and we'll use it as a platform to boldly speak about what we believe deeply. And even if we don't use Facebook or Twitter, we'll sit in the coffee shop or the, or the barber shop or, or the restaurant and we'll say things. And, and what we talk about the most, Edward, is kind of what I wrote in my notes, what we talk about the most is what we deeply care about and believe. So I did two things last week that made the bruises on my shin look like scrapes. I did two things this week that really gut punched me. I did two things. Number one, I scrolled through my Facebook timeline and I went all the way back to Easter. And if you would just take a snapshot of my Facebook timeline from Easter until now, this is what you would judge me to believe deeply and to speak boldly about. I've taken up golf during COVID. I went fishing during COVID. I love mowing and landscaping yards. I love buying flowers for my wife and planting flowers and cleaning my screened in porch and making a cigar lounge out there for me and Edward so we can chill out during COVID. I miss sports. I want the Premier League soccer back. I want baseball back. I want the NBA back. I have started re-watching every episode of Cheers. I was fascinated with Michael Jordan in The Last Dance. Ainsley is the best ag goat shower in the world. Boston is the best basketball player in the world. Those are the things that I've been posting. You had to go all the way back to Easter Sunday when I shared a picture to find the last time I spoke about Jesus on my social media platform. That hurt, but not as bad as what I'm about to share with you. You see, our words as Christians weigh a thousand pounds. You may not want to believe that. You may want to hide behind the keyboard. I may want to hide behind the keyboard. We may want to pretend like um, it doesn't really matter what we say, what we do, how we interact, how we approach people. But as Christians, our words weigh a thousand pounds simply because of who we claim to represent. Our social media platforms and our coffee shop visitations and our interaction with the people in restaurants have become avenues for venting, for complaining. I titled this message today, W-A-W-D. It's a playoff, W-W-J-D, and it means what are we doing? What are we doing? Second thing I did this week that hurt even more and scroll them on Facebook as I decided to take a survey. I listed 26 people that I thought would participate. And it ranged anywhere from professing atheists to agnostics to people that have been burned by the church to people that are going to church, that people that are leaders in the church all the way up to pastors. I did not ask any of our staff or any people here at Summit Heights and I wanted to do that on purpose. And I'll share those results with you in a moment. But first, I want to look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. Because in this passage, Paul says something very interesting in verse 18. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God, Jesus Christ reconciled me and you, the church, reconciled us to God, and then he gave us a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we were reconciled, and now we now have that same ministry of reconciliation. And in verse 19, he says that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We've been entrusted, like you said last week, use words, speak boldly about what you believe. We've been entrusted with a message, the message of reconciliation. And then he says this, therefore, in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, and we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. We've been given a message. 
We've been given a charge. God has entrusted us with a message, and he's made us an ambassador. Well, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is simply someone who acts as a representative or promotes a specific activity. He's a messenger. In the world, the United States sends ambassadors to other countries because they represent the United States. They represent our value. They, They promote the United States. They have a message. Paul has implored us to have a message of reconciliation and to be ambassadors here. Now, here's the Here's the thing. Ambassadors live on foreign soil. Ambassadors are representing their king or their beliefs, but they're doing it in hostile environments. Think about that for a second. We are on foreign soil, church. And I don't care how this country was founded. I don't care what the principles were back then. We are living in a time where we are becoming the minority voice. And if we don't change our approach, and if we don't get back to the message, we are going to lose everything. Paul said, we are ambassadors. We have been planted here and we have a specific message. The message of reconciliation. People needing to be reconciled to God. But there's more, and I'll get to that at the end. So what has our perceived message been over the last few months? And again, this is our halftime speech. The things that I'm about to read to you today come from about 21 of those 26 people, many of whom had this very common things to say, and I just kind of pushed them all together. There's about nine things here that really gut-punched me. And I don't fit into all these. I can't own all of these. You may not fit into all of these. I'm not asking you to own any of these. I'm not asking you to fit in any of these. I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to kick you in the shins. I'm not here to do anything but just to share with you all the way from atheists, agnostics, to seekers, to churchgoers, to ministers, to leaders, to pastors. This is the perceived message of the church over the last few months since COVID started. Not just in Hawkins. I mean, I went all over for this. Number one, we, the church, and I'm going to talk in terms of we, we, the church, are conspiracy theorists. (laughs) We, the church, are selfish. We don't want a social distance We don't want to wear masks, and that's fine, but we take it to a selfish level, as one person said. We, the church, have no empathy for others. And in quotes, as one person said, it has to to directly affect you before you even give a, and I won't use the word they used. In other words, there's no cases here, so why should we social distance? We tend to to worship our president more than the God that we profess to serve. The memes and the pictures that I see have more to do with Trump than Jesus. We don't listen. (laughs) We don't even want to hear what those who think and believe differently have to say. We shut down. We feel entitled that everyone should live by our ways. And then this one person said, I've read your Bible. Those people in that book of Acts seem to have a better message than you, and they were the minority running for their lives. This came from a church leader. This next one. Most of what I see the church doing on social media is shaming people for their lack of faith. Quit being scared. Throw your mask in the trash and have a little faith. Ambassador, a person who acts as a representative and a promoter of a specific activity and agenda. What are we doing, church? I decided to engage a few of these people in conversation One of the most brutal ones that I got, I decided to write back and say, sounds like we really suck. 
their response was, not just you, everybody. And they started sending me secular people that were doing the same thing. My response was, yeah, but I'm supposed to be different. Their response, well, if you go by WWJD, then I guess you're right. You do suck. Read a quote on the internet on social media, one of my friends posted this, and he was actually one of the people I interviewed too. He says, I think we've hit the limits of civility. Being right has replaced doing right. Where I'm from, we claim a faith of mercy, love, and repentance. Love is supposed to be the baseline of faith, yet we just can't get past ourselves. So we just self-destruct. And when we self-destruct, we tear everybody else down with us. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that Christian. I just don't. I don't want to be somebody, whether I mean to or not, and most of this is probably unintentional. Most of this is probably unintentional, but I still don't want to be that guy. I want to make sure, I want to reshift. I, I don't want to be that guy, and I don't want to be the guy that talks about nothing but golf and soccer and my kids and how great my yard looks. I don't want to be that guy either. I think for me personally, I took advantage of COVID-19. I've been on a two-month sort of vacation where I've worked in the yard every day. I've played a couple rounds of golf. I've gone fishing. I don't want to be that guy. And I think for some of us, we've taken advantage of COVID-19 because we've used the isolation and the lockdown to blast our social media with all the stuff that we, let me go back to Edward's quote, that we believe deeply. And whether we believe this deeply or not, Somewhere, somehow, we've started communicating a selfish message where we have no empathy for people, where we don't listen and we feel entitled and we shame people. Whether we mean to do that or not, that's what we've done. And, and my first reaction when I read that is, no, I haven't. I haven't done that. But then I have to go back to one of the answers, you don't listen. <laughs> You don't even want to hear what people who think differently have to say. So I have to take a step back and I have to ask myself a hard question. Am I this, am I, is that me? And even if it's not me personally, I'm still part of the family. And so I have to, I have to own what I can own and then I have to look at this phrase, has being right replaced what's doing right? And then I have to look at this atheist that said, well, if you go by WWJD, then yeah, you're right, you do suck. So what would Jesus do? In Luke chapter 4, Jesus begins his public ministry by going into a synagogue and unrolling a scroll of Isaiah. This is what he says in Luke 4, 16 through 19. He says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was given him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Jesus is basically saying, Here I am, the Spirit of the Lord, the anointed one, um, I am anointed. Church, we also are anointed. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the same power that raised him from the dead is the same power that lives in us and gives us the anointing to have this message and to go out and speak boldly about those things that we believe deeply. We are anointed to do that. But what was Jesus anointed to do? To proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, to kick off his ministry, Jesus says, this has been fulfilled in me. This is me. I am the anointed one. I am the one that will proclaim the good news to the poor. Church, what have we been proclaiming? Not necessarily to the poor, but you do realize since the beginning of the time, there's always been a divide. There's always been a less than. There's always been the haves and the have-nots. There's always been the rich and the poor. There's always been the minority and the majority. In Jesus' day, it was rich against poor. In our day, it's more um, racial and it's more um, socioeconomically. There's a these folks and a these folks. And these folks don't feel like they're being heard. And all these folks want to do is. Jesus said, I didn't come to beat these people down. I came to proclaim the good news to them. To proclaim that they can have liberty. To proclaim that they can recover their slight. To claim that they can be free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, it's interesting that year of the Lord's favor is literally talking about the time when God was willing to accept people or to receive the sinners could now come to him. Because up until then, it was just God and his chosen people. Jesus is now fixing to usher in something that's going to change everything. That everyone is going to be welcome to come to the table of God. That the gospel will assure that the guilty can be saved. That they can return. That, that the down and outs can have the same as these folks up here. That everyone is now ready to be entered into a relationship with God. There's also an illusion uh, that goes back into Leviticus of the year of uh, Jubilee, which was the 15 years when the trumpet would blow. And um, the whole land was then uh, 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 supposed to reset. The rich and the poor were supposed to come together. Slaves were set free. Um, It was the acceptable year, the time where everybody would be acceptable And on an even playing field. And Jesus says, that's what I've come to usher in. From now on, there is no poor. There is no rich. There is no socially down and out and uppity up. There is no black. There is no white. There is no Gentile. There is no Jew. That we are all one and level at the cross of Christ. And that was his message. And here we are 2,000 years later. And the people that we're supposed to be reconciling to God, whether we want to believe this or not, and I don't want to believe this, but some of them feel like we're not doing anything but shaming those that don't act like us. And that hurts. I was reading... um, The night of the Last Supper, Jesus, where he washes the disciples' feet, including Judas. We've all talked about that. And it, I just started praying through it, and I was like, Lord, there's something in there for me. What does this have to do with me? And I think this is kind of where God landed. I tend to write people off. I tend to I tend to put people in categories, um, and for most of my ministry, I think I've written a lot of people off, and I think think what's happened, and I think I'm doing better, but I think what I've done over the years is if I know that a person is probably not going to come to Christ, first of all, who am I to judge that? I'll just write them off. And then I'll begin to um, distance myself, and then I'll begin to well, that's that person. And then I'll begin to shame them. And I'll begin, and then it's almost like this weird evolution of I begin to expect them to act like me. Well, why would a non Christian act like me? They don't, they're not Christians. And I think what God was showing me in this passage is, is Jesus was still willing to serve those that would never follow him. Yeah. 
Jesus would have conversations with tax collectors and prostitutes. I think about the woman at the well, the Roman soldiers that would eventually be mocking him and casting lots for his clothes. He was willing to, to converse with them. Probably knowing all along those people would never follow him. And I just wonder, looking at these, these results from this survey, I just wonder if we as the church have written off you know, those darn liberals, those people that don't act like us. We don't, we don't even, it never even crosses our mind that I don't care if you're a conservative and you hate liberals. I don't care if you're a liberal and you hate conservatives. I don't care if you're straight and you hate gays. I don't care if you're, I, I don't care. When, 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 did, when did Jesus ever model that we're supposed to stop serving people just because they don't think and act like we do? I don't see that. Second Chronicles 7.14, I was reading that this morning. This wasn't even in my notes, but I was reading that this morning. It was in one of my devotionals. It's a pretty famous passage. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their land. Every time I hear this preach, every time I see a meme on Facebook, this is always talking about those people. You know, if those people that vote for abortion or those people that do this, if they'll ever blah, blah, blah. Maybe he's not talking about those people. Maybe he's talking to us. We're his people. Maybe we as the church are the ones that need to humble ourselves. Maybe we as the church are the ones that need to pray and seek his face. Maybe we as the church need to turn from our wicked ways. Remember, the Pharisees thought they had it all figured out too. They ended up being the wicked ones. I'm not saying, listen, I'm just, I'm thinking. Maybe we as the church are the ones that need to hear from heaven, not the lost people. Maybe we as the church are the ones that need our sins forgiven. Maybe we as the church are the ones that need the healing. played golf with a buddy of mine Friday and I was sharing with him kind of what was going through my mind he said Jake if I've learned anything over the last 12 years is you cannot change the world hiding behind social media yep but I tell you what if I was the devil and I wanted to disrupt the message of the church I think I would start throwing these little nuggets out there, COVID-19, protests, black guy, white police officer. And then I would just sit back and watch the church get distracted and watch the church go after those that don't think like them think if I was the devil, I'd throw that little nugget out there and I would want somebody that doesn't know Jesus to make a polarizing statement so that I can suck in the church that is supposed to be bringing a message of reconciliation so that they can attack. I think that's what I would do. Because when we get distracted, we start attacking other people. The very people that we're supposed to be loving and serving the very people that we're supposed to be washing the feet of. Now, I've seen some foot washing ceremonies and every one that I've seen, only two, everybody in there were Christ followers. I've never seen one where somebody who didn't know Jesus was there, but I've read about one in the book of John. When's the last time you washed the feet of somebody that you knew probably would never come to Christ? or think like you, or act like you, or talk like you. I've never done that. 
I think if I was the devil, I would just keep throwing these nuggets out and seeing how polarized I could get the church to act, knowing that people that don't know Jesus are going to act like that. But let me see if I can get the church to engage in it too. Because if I were the devil and I could get the church to engage in banter and shaming and arguing, then I can make sure that the message of the gospel doesn't get preached. That nobody ever hears about reconciliation. That nobody hears the good news that was supposed to be being proclaimed all along. And then if I did it enough and I could get the sides and opposition to be so polarizing, then I could end the greatest commandment of all that said that we are supposed to love God and love others. Because then what I could do is the devil, once I threw all these nuggets out, I could make sure that the only people the church ever gives a darn about are the ones that dress like them, act like them, talk like them. But we would never fall for that, would we? I think for me, I need to change my message. I need to get back to loving God and loving others, seeing people the way Christ sees them, praying for people the way God would want me to pray for them the way that people prayed for me when I didn't act this way or dress this way or talk this way or, you know, when I was lost. And I think maybe, just maybe, if we were to take a step back and be honest with ourselves, listen, you may be in this halftime speech and you're doing everything right. Amen. Fantastic. I'm not, but let's look at the macro level. The church as a body needs to change its message or we need to change the approach of how we're preaching the message. And so that's where I end. I'm going to pray for us. The band will come back and close us out. But I don't know where you are. Hopefully you're still with me. Um, But I'm just going to invite you to pray with me. And I'm going to invite you to do something that I used to do at youth camps Um, years ago, I'm going to invite you to draw a box around yourself. And the only people in the box are you and God. And I just want you to spend some time as the band worships. I don't want you to say anything to God. I don't want you to ask him anything. I just want you to sit in his presence and listen to what he has to say to you. Father God, I I love you. I've dealt with a lot this week personally, stuff I've not even shared with my family or my friends in preparation for, for today. I've dealt with the reality that on my platform, there's been nothing spiritual on it for months. I've dealt with the reality that Maybe, just maybe, I am part of the problem. But I've also dealt with the reality that you love me and you love your church and you love the people in this community and you love the people in the world. You love the people in this country. And as chaotic as things are looking right now, as Edward said, you are a peace giver. And I have felt that peace. And so, Father, my prayer for us as a church is that we would listen, that we would lean into you and receive your peace and then take that to a world that desperately, desperately needs it. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.